Coming up on Triangulation, I talked to Julian Guthrie. She is the author of Alpha Girls, about four women upstarts who took on Silicon Valley venture capital and made deals of a lifetime. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 402, recorded Monday, June 10th, 2019, for Friday, June 14th, 2019. Julian Guthrie, Alpha Girls. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed decision for your business. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where every week we talk to people writing about tech, working in tech, just uh, some of the most amazing minds writing about some of the other amazing minds in tech. And today I am very excited to welcome Julian Guthrie. Julian was a San Francisco Chronicle reporter for 20 years. She's written several books and her most recent book is Alpha Girls. And it is about four women who pioneered the world of venture capital. And uh, I'm excited to talk to her today. Thank you so much for coming on, Julian. Super excited to get a chance to talk with you. So the women that you write about, they helped finance or build uh, Facebook, Trulia, uh, Tesla, Skype, The Real Real, Walmart, Google, Dropbox. I'm sure I've uh, missed a lot. Why haven't we heard about them before? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that women historically have been written out of history. So history isn't just what happens, it's who's recording the history. And women also have held themselves back from the spotlight. Women who are the others or the only one at the table, surrounded by men. These are women in working in male-dominated industries, the male-dominated industry of tech and venture capital, but they didn't want to single themselves out in the spotlight because they were trying to become a part of the team, which was entirely all male. So I think there are two things that are happening here or have happened historically. One is w women have not sought out the spotlight for themselves. I think also actually three things, um, journalists and historians, technologists have not looked for those women who are there and who have succeeded and they are there. Um, and then again, it's just a, a, another bias that we live with in the world that uh, the go-to people in terms of who are the successes have been the men. I mean, the men, you know, that you associate with Silicon Valley or the people, the stars of Silicon Valley have been all men. And I hope that's changing. So as you mentioned, this is a problem in all, all, all every field. Um, you, you actually write that you got the idea of for this book um, from your last book, How to Build a Spaceship, which was about the founder of the X Prize. And you looked around and, you know, as researching it and then doing your book tour, there were just mostly men around. Um, so, so seeing that this is a problem in so many different places. Why, uh, why choose venture capital as, as a jumping off point to, to find these women uh, that have this experience? Well, it was kind of a circuitous path to get to these women, but I feel like venture capital as an industry has this outsized influence and it's really little understood, but it's uh, those who write the checks in venture capital help finance and build the companies of our future. So, in essence, the decision makers, the power brokers of venture capital, who are men, are shaping the future. So I learned this statistic, 94% uh, of all venture partners, those check writing partners are men, but that made me think there are 6% of venture capitalists who are succeeding, who are women. So I wanted to know who they are, what their jobs are like, what is it like being the only woman at the table? What is it like being the only one chasing after a deal again and again and again? What is it the, What is it like to be the only woman when you walk into a room for a board meeting or another meeting? And again, you're the only woman. Um, and also, what does it mean when we have such inequality uh, in terms of representation just among voices when you have this affinity bias where like higher like or like you know write checks to those who look very much like them so 
if uh, it was Melinda Gates who told me in an interview, uh, she said, you know, and it's my belief, and it was kind of my my premise early on was that if venture capital doesn't diversify, tech won't diversify. So it's kind of the start of this food chain. Um, and that's why, again, it's just, it's a dynamic field. It's a field where women can make a lot of money. And I like the idea of women having more money, controlling more of the money because money equals power, of course. Um, and then it's just a super cool industry where you get to meet with, you know, entrepreneurs and hear their ideas and intellectually pretty dazzling stuff. It's interesting that you bring up Melinda Gates. I um, am reading her book, um, the, Mo- the Moment-, Moment of Lift um, uh-huh. and her biography. And um, and it's, it's such an inter- interesting story because she is, you know, a powerful woman in her own right. And she started it, you know, she's one of the first employees at Microsoft. She was there early. But, you know, a lot of people still think of her as the wife of Bill Gates. And um, so it, it, it's, I think right now, like we see um, younger women thinking like, oh, well, they would never do that. I mean, often that would not be allowed in companies <laughs> now to be dating uh, someone else that you worked with. Um, so has 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 it really changed? I mean, have you seen a lot of changes since then? Or they, some of these women are Melinda Gates's generation, I guess. Um, has a lot changed since then? Uh, I, some things have changed, but some things have not. Like, I feel like progress in terms of um, equity in in race, in ethnicity, in gender has really stalled. And that, that has been shocking to me as I've gotten into this research. Uh, but there is progress in the venture capital world, only because the spotlight has been shining in a very glaring way on tech and on venture capital after the Me Too movement, you know, when... Um, when, you know, starting it with the media industry in New York and with Harvey Weinstein and all of those cases in Hollywood, uh, the tech industry had its own convulsive period like that, that, you know, I hope was very cathartic, but there's a, there's a spotlight that has shined on the industry and in needing to diversify. And there are a lot of good guys in the industry too, who do want more diversity, but I think, you know, it's just a matter of talking about it, thinking about it, and then acting on it because, um, this affinity bias is again, very powerful, you know, you're, you know, and the old, by bi- old, by bi- old, old boys club has worked, they would say. But, you know, my question is, has it? And um, I would say, if you don't believe in diversity um, across the board, whether for gender or, um, or race, you know, if you don't believe in it as a moral or ethical imperative, you know, there's a bottom line imperative where um, studies show that the most profitable companies are also the mo- most diverse at the top in the top management ranks. So I see progress, but it's also shocking that we are where we are as a society and in the United States that we're not leading this charge, um, that the representation of women in top levels across industries, there's so many industries, ranges between five and 20%, that's it. So it's uh, it's really just a shocking uh, thing to look at the statistics of where women are. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's interesting. I'm sure a lot of men would say the old boys network worked. But if you point to a lot of the problems that the technology industry is encountering right now, um, they are serious problems just of abuse and the toxic culture. And I mean, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. but you wonder, like, had women um, had more power in... Um, you know, in, in the room writing the checks for these particular companies, might they have come up with some, um, you know, questions about, well, if your business model is, you know, is based on this, could it then turn into, um, you know, people getting likes for posting really um, uh, offensive com- content? But that said, one of the people featured in the book, Teresa Gao, was one of the people writing the checks for Facebook. <laughs> and that is, right. uh, and, and, and that is a great story. I mean, I love the way the, that you write the book. Um, it's like a novel and it's like my favorite novels where they have several characters and you go from one to the next and you just, their stories intertwine. Sometimes, you know, they see each other across the room. I know Sonia, um, 
one of the women uh, was a, a, a worked for Menlo Ventures and one of the other women were coming to pitch her. So it's really, I love the way that it's written, but I wonder, um, was there any moment where you thought you. I would, that you would just write about one of them? Like what, why, why all four? Um, I never considered writing about one of them because I wanted to show a number of things with the narrative. I wanted to have a cast of characters who, if you didn't identify with one, then maybe you would identify with the next woman. I kind of like, this may seem like a weird comparison, but when you think of sex in the city, you know, you think of these women arriving in New York and kind of starting out on these dreams and all the ups and downs. And, you know, are you more of a Carrie or are you more of a Miranda or Samantha. Um, and I found that these women, just as I was starting to kind of cast this net uh, to figure out who would be my main, the main figures of the book, I really liked, um, I started zeroing in on this group of four women. I like their backstories. I like how different they were in everything from, again, their backgrounds, their immigrant stories. Um, socioeconomic situations when they came to Silicon Valley um, and even what they invested in. So I did look at it in a very novelistic or even filmic way, um, visually thinking about, you know, these women as young women arriving on the canvas, so to speak, of Silicon Valley with their dreams and then setting out on these different journeys. And it was interesting because, you know, their narratives only intersect in the earliest days uh, a few times and they were working like within a mile of one another but that's how isolated women and these are women who are working in the industry today so this is not like you know 100 years ago or 70 years ago or 50 years ago although the book spans a great length of time but these women are all working in the industry today um but you know, I like this idea of their differences and yet their commonalities. And they were working with, as I said, within like a mile of one another, but seldom had the chance to meet one another. Again, going back to your early question of, you know, why don't we know their names? Um, I think that these women, they were doing so much to fit in, to become a part of the team, to succeed as kind of outsiders moving their way in to the inner circle, that they were networking more with the guys than with the few women who were in the industry. Yeah, that is uh, something very unique about their stories. As a woman, um, you know, working, covering tech for so long, I often, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by men as well, and I often think, you know, am I here uh, despite being a woman or am I here because I'm a woman? You know, we all have those thoughts of like, oh, they're just trying to fill the quota. Um, do, do you, it sounds to me from reading the story that they also struggled with that sometimes. I mean, do you think these four women were, had the positions that they had because they were women or despite being women or both? I think despite being women, I think because there was no pressure, there was no external pressure uh, on these firms at that time when they were hired, really, to be hiring, to be diversifying as there's pressure now. Um, these women were hired because they were, you know, super talented and they were scrappy and they were entrepreneurial and they were great at math or they were engineers or electrical engineers or they were just out of, you know, Harvard Business School and had been um, teaching, you know, computer classes since they were 12 years old. Uh, so, you know, they were super talented, really qualified. And in the world of venture capital, you, you know, education, historically uh, coming from a very prestigious sort of school like Harvard or Brown, um, one of the Ivy Leagues or certainly Stanford, they were feeding, you know, feeders for, uh, for venture capital. So, you know, Sonia was the only one, Sonia Perkins from the South, who came to Silicon Valley via Harvard, and but very scrappy, you know, this entrepreneurial kid. Um, and when she arrives, you know, she she does, when she lands her first job, which was actually in Boston, she looked around, it was like day three when she was there, and she looked around this beautiful office and she saw no other women except for the um, support staff, the secretaries. And 
called secretaries at the time. And, you know, in that moment, she was like, oh, my God, was I hired because I'm a woman? And she kind of moped around for a few days and thinking there are no other women there and maybe it was a quota hire. And then she just told herself and you know, she just said, snap out of it. I don't care what it was. Um uh, you know, in retrospect, I don't think it was, again, because there wasn't that spotlight on her. But regardless, at that point, she made a decision to, as she said, snap out of it. She looked herself in the mirror and she uh, she just was going to, um, you know, do a really killer job and, you know, exceed expectations of her own and of her bosses. And that took her far in life. So I guess my question isn't... And just- if they succeeded because they were women isn't necessarily negative either. I mean, especially in their, in their, some of the later parts where they are um, very successful. Do you think some of them succeeded uh, being like mother figures or in, you know, other ways were just high achieving? I know there was a quote, like, if you want to get the job done, hire a working mom. And that's, you know, <laughs> just like we, we have some good, quali- I mean, we have, women have good qualities. Um, do you think that being a woman, uh, being women, really uh, was helpful to them, not just because of a quota, but just because those skills that they had um, really, they helped them be high achievers? I don't think so. I mean, in Silicon Valley, you make friends when you make them money. Mm. And um, so, I mean, to be really, you know, bottom line blunt about it, they were money makers. You know, they performed. They raked in the money. They made great deals. Um, They also, you know, Magdalena, especially being from... um, from Europe, well, she was from from Istanbul, Turkey. She, you know, she said she was taught from a very early age to being well mannered was more important even than being well educated. And so, when she got to the venture firm uh, USVP after being a serial entrepreneur, she wouldn't hesitate to go around the table. And if she was, you know, getting cookies at a partners meeting. She would go, you know, partner to partner, and they were all men, and offer them cookies and offer coffee. Because for her, that wasn't so much about gender. It was more about hospitality. Uh, Another example of that. So maybe, you know, maybe that was endearing uh, to them, but that's just who Magdalena was and is. And she was very upfront about who she was and what she has to offer. Um, Similarly, when she started at this venture firm, she learned, you know, all the guys were getting together, all the partners were getting together to watch football together. And Magdalena doesn't know a single thing about American sports. And she thought I could go and I could fake it. I could pretend to talk the language. And but she decided, no, what she was going to do was bring something of her own to the table. And that is cooking. And she loves to cook and she makes these great um, Turkish uh, dishes. And so she started inviting the partners over for a once a month feast, basically. And soon it became as popular as football games. And so everybody wanted to be invited to these grand, uh, warm, you know, hospitable sort of dinners that she hosted. So in that way, again, she was just playing to her strengths. Uh, in those cases, those are more traditionally feminine uh, traits but uh, but it was really, you know, they succeeded because they were badasses. They worked really hard. They were quantitative. Uh, they brought in a ton of money. They brought in new clients. So, you know, they, they made friends by making money. And yeah, it's just like you said, they were super tough. Um, the, you have one story in the book with Teresa Gao where uh, she was 28, I think, and she had to fire one of the founders who was maybe twice her age. And he's, his response was, I'm not going to be fired by a woman. And <laughs> she looked around and said, well, do you see anyone else here? You're fired. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, not to say they were just cooking or baking yeah. all the time. There was right, yeah. right, right. They well, they were. That was that was M. J. Elmore who oh, came sorry. west, and that's okay. There are four of those <laughs> figures, so it's easy to interchange them. Um, 
that was MJ Elmore. And that was a great story. I love that. You know, and these women also were very successful because they had thick skin. They used humor to diffuse potentially, you know, tense situations. They knew when to take issue with an off color joke and when to let it go. You know, when would maybe it was clueless, but not intended to be malicious. Uh, and they, you know, they made these really wise decisions about, again, when to take issue with something, when to use humor and let it go, when to network, when not to network, um, and how to succeed by specializing in within their industry, finding a specialty. For Teresa Gao, it was cybersecurity. So she became a trailblazer really in these uh, huge cybersecurity companies. I was at one earlier today called Forescout. And she also, you know, she she helped Shlomo Kramer, who's a star of cybersecurity, uh, launch Imperva, which was originally called Web Cohort. You know, she studied, you know, after hours, she went to all the networking cybersecurity conferences. And this was when it was more of a backwater sort of industry. It was not like it is today. And so she, you know, she specialized in that and she gained credibility in that and she made huge deals in that as a result. But a lot of what they did was just sort of play by the rules. Um, and when I think, before I read this book, I the the really only experience I had with how women were treated in venture capital was Ellen Pau, uh, who lost her case. And again, that was before the Me Too movement. She lost her harassment case. And you write a little bit about Pau in the book. Um, what what are your what do the subjects of your book really think about what happened to Ellen Pau? I know they were uh, they're all I believe a little bit older than Ellen Pau, a little bit maybe not an entire generation, not all of them. But what do they think about what happened there? I think Teresa is probably only a few years older, maybe um, similar, close to being peers. Um, I think they were very supportive of her for, you know, for coming out. They have a very different, you know, she play, Ellen P played a really important role in bringing this, raising these issues. And uh, but but the women that I profile had a very different way of dealing with um, with slights and insults and discrimination. They really saw these things as obstacles, if you will. I don't mean to underplay, you know, what Ellen presented in her suit against Kleiner Perkins at all. But, um, you know, I think that the women of Alpha Girls succeeded because they didn't look for discrimination. And I think that they... Uh, kind of looked past certain things so that they could succeed in venture capital. And maybe that will raise some eyebrows, but there was, um, you know, it was like the Trojan horse uh, analogy here where you need to get your foot in the door and you need to kind of become a part of the team before you can lead that team and before you can make any changes within a company or an industry. And they were in this way, the trailblazers because they stayed in, they made it work, they're in it today. Uh, they achieved great credibility. They have great male allies. Um, you know, so we need, I call them tempered radicals. And I see it, we need both kinds. We need the Ellen Powell kind who, you know, kind of um, uh, waves a placard, if you will, and, and, and tries to disrupt the status quo with a dramatic act, this lawsuit. And then we need others like these tempered radicals who, the, the women of my book, who work within a system, as you said, to affect change, where you know, they, they, they tally these really small victories, but those small victories add up to something significant. And then they get to the point in their career because they're going from navigating before, it's my belief you can't pioneer until you navigate for a long time. I think most of us succeed in that way by playing by somebody's rules, right? And it's not a bad thing. It's figuring out what those rules are, advancing your own cause at the same time, and then ideally getting to the point in your career where you're strong enough, powerful enough, successful enough, have a great track record, where you can start rewriting the rules. So 
it's a very interesting question that you asked. Um, and I see kind of a fundamental difference in approach and I see how both are needed. Uh, I think the women of Alpha Girls kind of show how it is possible to succeed in a male dominated industry, whether, you know, it, it doesn't have to be tech, it's just set in Silicon Valley. But unfortunately, there are so many male dominated industries today, you know, whether in architecture or building or medicine or law or advertising, uh, sports, on and on and on. Um, so I see it as kind of this blueprint and there's not one path to success, but these women took different paths. And, you know, I think now that they, they stayed in it and they found success and now they're adding to the dialogue. They're trying to rewrite the rules for this next generation or even for right now where we are in society. So I think that is one uh, approach that can be very, very effective and very rewarding. And would you say that it's still necessary? I mean, would these women say, you know, you uh, have to get along and follow the rules in order to make the rules? Or would they be more likely to say, you know, we endured this so you don't have to? Like, for example, I mean, I think it's MJ uh, Elmore who says um, that that she uh, stopped wearing dresses because people would always say, oh, you look so cute. Um, I mean, would is that still something that they would suggest that a person do getting into venture capital that a woman would should do or have we moved beyond it where like it's just not okay to tell a woman that she looks cute if she's there to um if you're you know if she's there as a venture capitalist i think there's a little bit of both i think we've moved beyond um certainly in the bay area because there's so much awareness around this we've moved beyond you know this sort of um cluelessness i hope but you know i do think that it's not a bad thing for women to be aware of what the quote unquote uniform of the job is. And that doesn't mean you have to lose your own identity, but um, there is something about, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, what we wear makes the first impression. And it, um, you know, you think, but you can, you can create, you can, you can wear the uniform, but then you can have your own personalization of it. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, she wears, of course, the black robe of the jurists, you know, which were made for men and have the cutout for the tie. And she wears these really beautiful ornamental collars. And maybe that's her little act of defiance, you know, against the uniform. And Teresa Gao, you know, she adopted the uniform of venture capital when she started, but she refused to give up her beloved high heeled shoes. So maybe it was this also little act of defiance against a macho culture. You know, I'm not saying that, um, women have to dress like men. I don't think that's it. But you don't want to be uh, still today. You do not want to be uh, distracting in a business environment. So that's what I would say about that. So yes, we have moved past, but uh, it's important to be mindful. I was just talking with a young woman about this in uh, Los Angeles last week, and uh, she's gone to all these pitch meetings and she loves to dress very flamboyantly. And she said, you know, this next time, because she always gets comments on what she's wearing and she's not gotten funded yet, but she gets enthusiastic comments about her, her outfits. And so she said this time she's going to just tone it down a little bit, just so it's not a distraction in a business setting. It is a tough one. I mean, there's no easy answer to this at all. I mean, I think, you know, I'm in my mid forties. I've been, I'm more, probably more um, of the, like, just follow the rules so you can make the rules. Um, but, you know, I have a 16 year old daughter and it's hard to, I mean, she still has to understand mm -hmm. that it's a, this is a world that we live in and you're going to be judged. It's unfortunate. I wish it wasn't that way, but you're going to be judged about, um, you know, by what you wear. And, um, you know, there are certain situations and, you know, when you post yourself pictures of yourself on Instagram, <laughs> that is maybe not the best. Yes, it's I like, know, you know, know, you know, and it's like, yes. you want to raise Those messages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to raise, a, uh, you know, a teenager this now to say like, you, you know, we blaze the path for you, do whatever you want, but we are still living in a world. And especially you make a really good point that here in the Bay Area, we live in a bit of a bubble and the rest of the world is maybe not caught up with that yet. So yeah, there's no easy answer. 
Um, so, but you- I think it's also, you know, I mean, not to get too um, psychoanalytical here, but you know, it conveys, it sends a message that you're uh, that you want to be a part of the team, mm. and any industry is looking for that, right? I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of people you can collaborate with, people you can learn from, but. Um, Remember, too, that we have this strong affinity bias, and that is we're attracted to people who, you know, look like us, dress like us, uh, and all of that, for better or for worse, but that's there. And the way you dress sends sends a message. I want to keep talking about Alpha Girls, your great book, but first I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Captera. If you uh, are in a business and you need software, check out Captera because Captera will have the software that is exactly right for you. They're the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solutions for your business. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe your business is growing and it's time to change the software. Maybe the software you're using right now is not so great. Maybe you just like to add software. Whatever your business need is Captera is there to help. Read thousands of real software reviews and find the right software for your business at captera.com slash triangulation. There are over 900,000 reviews and these reviews are from people who have used the product. There's 30,000 fresh reviews available each month. You can discover everything you need to make an informed decision because software can be expensive and you want to have all the information you need before you make that decision. You can search more than 700 specific categories of software like CMS or email marketing software, IT service software, SEO, and workflow management. That's just to name a few. Once you choose a category, you can filter results by the product rating, the users, deployment, and all the features. Then you can compare them side by side up to four at a time. So you can see right now I'm comparing different software and you can see how it compares in terms of ease of use, customer support, all the features, the functionality, even the value you get for the money. And it lists out the features too. So you can see what features it has and what software features it doesn't have. There's also screenshots. Captera believes that software makes the world a better place because software can help every organization become a more efficient, effective version of itself. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Check out Captera's free website today at captera.com slash triangulation. That's captera.com slash triangulation. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash triangulation. Captera software selection simplified. And we thank Captera for their support of triangulation. So do you think, uh, considering Ellen Pau and, you know, we, we're sort of, um, I, I don't want to say post Me Too movement, but I mean, we are, the Me Too movement is not in the past, but it has happened. And um, some of those men uh, accused in the Me Too movement had actually been some of the same women that had supported um, these women that you write about. How did they deal with that when that happened? I can't remember the specific incident that you were referring to. There were there were so many men who were, because of this power imbalance, who were outed, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, for their very bad behavior. Mostly the dynamic was between VC and woman entrepreneur because the woman entrepreneur needs the money and the man has the money. Uh, so there were issues in a lot of stories that came out around that, around that power imbalance. And then, you know, all sorts of allegations about, uh, you know, drug and sex parties where, they were largely led by the male um, entrepreneurs and and the leading you know guys in this industry, and then the women, younger women who are trying to break into the industry, you know. So there are all sorts of kind of salacious stories around this, but um, and the women were you know connected by degree to some of these entrepreneurs and venture capitalists who were later who were late who later were uh, were, were were outed you know and and then they they were kind of grounded so to speak i haven't seen much worse that has happened and now they're starting to get back into the industry so it's uh, but that's also across industries and it's it's you know, but again, it goes back to, and that's what the women of Alpha Girls would say: this um, 
this power imbalance, which is at the root of the problem. You're not going to have this issue if more women are the ones who are writing the checks. And so a lot of it comes down to, you know, who's in the top management positions in whatever industry it is. And that will solve a lot of a lot of these problems. Right. So do you think that there is going on now in venture capital men saying, um, well, we're, we're not going to hire women because we don't going to get in trouble? Oh, definitely. There are men who are saying that. But I also think that, you know, it's going to it's going from one extreme to another where you have, um, you know, post Alan Powell and and the Me Too movement. There's a lot of confusion over what men can say and not say. And can I compliment, you know, a woman colleague who I work with regularly and, you know, we respect each other. But can I can I compliment her going back to the dress on the you know on what she's wearing? Should I open the door for her? Can I ask her if she's going out for coffee, you know, to bring back coffee? Uh, men who you know like Mike Pence, they will not have a one-on-one -on -one meeting after hours with a woman. Many men will not even have a closed-door meeting with a woman who works for them, just one-on-one. -on -one. So I think we have to come back to. Um, you know, a middle ground and have, you know, this is what I hope with Alpha Girls, that it will be read by men and women and that there will be this dialogue because it can't just be women talking among women, although that's a lot of fun and great. And there's power to that too. But, um, but you know, there has to be a sincere desire uh, from both sides to kind of come together. But I did hear from uh, more than one VC. Actually, there's a term uh, for their um, sudden, not, or maybe not so sudden, but mandate, maybe it was even tacit, unspoken, not to hire women, and they call it, um, they don't want to be POWed, P-A-O apostrophe D, after Ellen Pow. So, no way, we're not hiring any women. So, that uh, that's a reality, too. And I hope that that is the tiny, tiny minority, and that you know, the good guys out there will see um, the power and potential and the fun uh, in having and the mind expansion that happens when you have this diverse group um, and primarily, you know, by gender and and obviously race. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think the book is not just for women. I think that anyone, any entrepreneur, whether you're a man or a woman, should read it. I mean, if you want to get venture money, this is a really good look into what that world is like. Um, and especially because, I mean, I don't want to give any spoilers, but like you said just uh, a minute ago, these women have joined forces together. They've created the Broadway Angels and, and other projects together so that they are uh, women, you know, a room full of women funding women and sometimes men. Right. It also, I mean, in the, in the book, I get into the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem and I tell stories that are really interesting and even that haven't been told but before, like, you know, that, that don't have anything to do with gender actually, but that are about um, some of these big name companies of today, like Skype, where you get this behind the scenes story of the founders and when they were going out for money and the and the deals they were trying to strike and how VCs who were chasing after that deal, you know, the back and forth, the courtship, the legalese, uh, the drama, the intrigue. So I, you know, I, I did get into that world in places where it's not about gender. These stories, some of the stories are not about gender, uh, but they're about the industry itself. And with these, you know, household name companies. So, uh, I, there, this Teresa Gao, who, um, one of the women in the stories, uh, you wrote about her, how she felt like she was constantly deciding between being liked and being respected, which I think is uh, something that not just women, but men can also, I, th I think it's traditionally uh, something that women struggle with. And there was a moment that I, I just loved where you write that um, when she you know, was in charge of a, a staff full of people and a woman would leave to say, I have to leave to go pick up my child. And your first instinct would say like, well, a woman who understands 
understands the trials of being a mother would just say, go ahead, you go. Um, whereas she would say, um, what about your partner? What about the babysitter? Like, was there anyone else? And that was uh, sort of seen as the, the kinder thing to do, to say to a woman, because I think as women, a lot of times we think, well, we're the only ones who can do it. Um, you know, I have to leave my job. My husband or my partner can't leave their job. Um, talk a little bit about that. Well, I think that's a really interesting story that actually few people have picked up on. And that is um, women managers who are the onlys or the others, you know, they're looked at by their male peers as kind of how, you know, how they act, the decisions that they make uh, embody represent, you know, for better or for worse, right or wrong, how other women will uh, react, respond, decide in that situation. So what does it mean where men, uh, you know, look to Teresa's decision and, you know, they're like, oh, well, okay, she didn't, Im she didn't immediately side with the woman who wanted to, you know, go and take care of her kids because moms disproportionately are the go-to parent, um, even when both parents work. And so maybe that's how, you know, that comes to represent how all women will, uh, will behave, will react in that same situation. But Teresa also wanted, you know, wanted the women to know that, um, you know, that they should, they, you know, don't by your overachievement, don't enable your partners, your husbands, your whatever it is, underachievement, you know, don't do everything, you know, ask, why don't you go? You know, why don't you step aside? Why don't you take the kids here? Why don't you do this at home? And these are all questions. So there was a lot behind that story, uh, a lot of lessons actually behind that story for women managers uh, and for for, um, you know, how women interact with other women. Now, and I think about, um, uh, I think about uh, the other story that really spoke to me was Magdalena Yesel. She helped uh, Mark Benioff build sa Salesforce. And there's this moment where, um, where she didn't ring the bell with Mark Benioff at the New York Stock Exchange. She was home mm -hmm. taking care of her sick son. And um, I mean, when I first when I first read about that, I thought, oh, well, that that is typical of women because, and it's not, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, like, you know, ringing the bell. Okay, that's great and amazing. And maybe your only choice to ever do that. I probably will never do that. Um, <laughs> but, but then later she's, and I, I think of it as like, well, women, we make decisions, what matters and what doesn't. But later she sort of regrets that. Like we're, um, were there a lot of, like, did, did they talk a lot about regrets when you interviewed them? It was very hard to get the regrets from these women. And Magdalena, when I asked her about regrets at some point in my reporting, she said, oh, no, I have no regrets. And I said, everybody has regrets. And But it was hard to get the women to be open about where they made mistakes, uh, where they were hurt, um, who hurt them what was unexpected, what was the most injurious kind of. And Magdalena, you know, I love that story about Salesforce because here she was, you know, serial entrepreneur and then VC and she had, you know, she was the first investor and first board member of Salesforce. And she helped that company from, you know, idea through IPO. She saved it at one point in the dot-com bust. Um, by coming up with this whole different uh, payment mechanism for customers. It was seen kind of as radical at the time. And, uh, but it was, you know, it was a super important key um, life-saving, if you will, move for, for Salesforce. And then when Salesforce goes public, you know, an IPO only happens once, like a birth, uh, you know, they were at the New York Stock Exchange and Mark Benioff had wanted her to be there with him. And she said, no, I can't go. I've got, you know, my son is sick. But what she didn't do is she didn't ask her husband, her, um, you know, her, one of her relatives, um, a babysitter, somebody, she felt she needed to be there. And now she even says, and this is humorous, but it really tells the story. And that is for the life of her, she can't remember which boy was sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, you know, but she would certainly remember standing there on the dais at the New York Stock Exchange and, she, and, and you know, not just ringing the bell, but also 
here's an image. Okay, so you're in that mo- you're in that moment. You're on the New York Stock Exchange at the New York Stock Exchange. You're in the photos forever. So there's another woman in the picture. You know, typically with a lot of men who are standing there. So it's you know, all of these things have repercussions and have kind of a domino effect. And but her point is, you know, you don't Magdalena's point now looking back with that wisdom, right, of hindsight is you don't have to be there all the time for your kids. There are times as a working woman, as someone who's passionate about a career, where it's okay to be selfish. And this wouldn't even necessarily have been selfish. It would have just been um, a, uh, a victory, a celebration, if you will, an exclamation point on what she'd already achieved. So that's her point. It's not to be a neglectful parent by any means, but it's okay for us to first involve, really do more involving of our partners, our spouses, and set that out, delineate those responsibilities um, early on, because still today, disproportionately, you know, women do a lion's share of the work, even when both partners work. And that really holds women back and pulls women back from the glass ceiling. And um, so Magdalena, I love that story about Magdalena. She's just a great character anyway. She's so full of life. She kind of jumps off the page. Yeah. <laughs> um- so uh, Sandy Kurtzig, who's not one of the women, but she uh, was an inspiration to some of the women in the book. She was the first woman to take a tech company public. Um, she says, if you look for sexism, you're never going to get where you want to go. Now, is that another thing? Do you think that is still true um, now? Or do you think that was a remnant of the past? I actually think it's true. I mean, I think that, you know, there are different gradations, of course, of offenses, and, you know, if it's sexual harassment, uh, report it, do something about it. If it's a dumb joke, uh, probably, you know, maybe say something, maybe let it go. Um, because you do want to become a part. If this is a job you really like and a career you want to succeed in and advance in, uh, you have to make yourself a part of the team and you have to network. And, um, you know, the likability factor is important in all that we do, right? Uh, And you want to achieve and you need to network. So I think if you look for sexism, you won't get where you want to go. Um, I think that, I think that's the mentality that these women of alpha girls had. But at the same time, they have a spine and they are going to stand up for themselves uh, when it's something hurtful, harmful, um, seriously offensive. But I think there are other occasions where, again, you know, off color jokes, uh, guys talking among themselves, um, there's really no harm intended. So it's discerning the when, you know, when there's sexism. Um, I do, I do think though that, uh, women more and more rightfully so are standing up against these things and for one another and creating these powerful networks that uh, I hope will be a voice for change and of activism. But again, it has to be, it has to be between the genders. It has, it can't be us versus them. Yeah, it is such a challenge because I think there's also, um, you know, it's a certain amount of people are watching you if you're a successful woman, you know, it's, it's part of the, it's the same thing. If you're any kind of successful minority, if you're a successful uh, person of color and then, you know, you, more people are looking at you to see how you react, how you handle things. So I think it's sometimes difficult to think like, well, I'll just ignore this. The sexism doesn't bother me. So, you know, but I think people are often watching when I asked you earlier, I, I asked, you know, why for, women, why not just one woman? And I think as we've been talking, it's become clear that it's really important because all three of, all four of these women are, are similar in some ways, but they all had very different experiences and all women are not the same. Well, I do like that about the book. I like it that, um, you know, you have different paths, you have, you know, as I said, different backgrounds, you have different dramas, you have different betrayals, um, you have problems, you know, at home uh, with one marriage, two marriages, actually. You have one woman uh, being diagnosed with very aggressive breast cancer, and at the same time, she's adopting a baby, um, and then she goes to work, and she's surrounded by men, and suddenly the world looks very different to her. Uh, so, 
you know, they and Magdalena is this, you know, serial entrepreneur, very frank, very matter of fact, very analytical in her thinking. Uh, so they're very different. Yes, they are very different. I think, I think taken to, I think separately they're really interesting, and I think collectively, you know, as a whole, that they are a really interesting um, kind of tapestry, if you will. They're really. I mean, I, I I love them as characters. I really like them as people too. But as a writer, as a storyteller, I think they work really well um, as characters in the narrative. And their journeys are interesting. You know, their journeys are surprising, and um, and as you said, different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, one of them has a partner who's not who's you know, not supportive of the fact that she makes more money and, uh, but not, but others have very supportive partners. So that's, you know, but uh, speaking of characters, the book has been opted for television. Um, what can you tell us about that? So that's really fun. And the thing I'm most excited about is this happened at the proposal stage. So I'd just written the proposal. We were shopping it around my agent and we had maybe eight, we had multiple, multiple offers and they were all from men except for one, a woman named Kathy Shulman who she, it turns out she was very dogged. I mean, she came in early and strong and she followed up with me and she asked if, you know, she and I could have a one-on-one conversation um, apart from agent conversations. And so she you know, it kind of showed me what women in these super competitive male dominated industries have to do. You have to go about it so doggedly and you have to do more. And she did more and she came in stronger. And I love it that, you know, I was it, asking others in the industry, like, who should I go with? I was really like, you know, George Clooney's firm. And then we have Amazon and then we have Sony and we have all this interest. And I kept coming back to this fact that Kathy Shulman, she's a great filmmaker. She's one of three women in history to win an Academy Award as a producer, um, which is crazy that only three women have won. Uh, but Kathy's won. She's, you know, she's a trailblazer herself. She's the founder of women in film in Hollywood. And she's, you know, she's young and she's doing dynamic stuff and she gets it. She's lived this, you know, she she's lived this world and, and then some. Um, so I'm really proud that, um, I'm partnering on this with Kathy Shulman and she has this fantastic screenwriter working on it. Her name is Margaret Nagel. And so I've introduced them to the alpha women, the alpha girls and, and to additional women who are entrepreneurs. Um, and so they're writing a multi-season, um, series. And we'll have a big announcement on this any day now. It's in, it's a, the next step is in contract stage, but I'm hoping we'll have an announcement uh, even by the end of this week. But it's moving forward, so that's exciting, and Kathy has a great vision for it. It will dramatize it. It will fictionalize it in really fun ways uh, for television, but we'll keep, it'll keep the name. It'll still be Alpha Girls. You know, which Kathy, Kathy loved the name. It was like, you know, she gets a pile of proposals and manuscripts and things sent her way. And it was on her assistant's desk and she walked by and she's like, oh, my God, what is what is Alpha Girls? I got to look at that. And that's she told me this story after. But um, but she's a wonderful human being. And so I'm really excited about it. Will the announcement include casting or is that are you not at that stage yet? No, not at that stage no. yet. I'm so excited because TV is so good right now. I mean, that's, I haven't, it is. you know, and it's just, especially for women and voices that haven't been heard. I think that's is a perfect medium for it. Alpha Girls, the women upstarts who took on Silicon Valley's male culture and made the deals of a lifetime by Julian Guthrie. Um, and Julian has several other books um, that are well worth reading. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for reading this book. Of course, the book is available uh, wherever you buy books. Um, and uh, so buy it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for taking the time. It was to a talk pleasure. To All right. Take care. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Triangulation. Triangulation records uh, when when we have time to record, we record, and then uh, you can subscribe and get it immediately. So usually that happens on, on Friday afternoon. You can get a new episode of Triangulation. I'm Megan Maroney. You can find me at Megan Maroney on Twitter, and you can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash try. And we'll see you next week.